Depression in the late 20s, early 30s. And when, you know, Al Capone and those guys were shooting up the town, and he was actually shot in the line of duty with his own gun taking a, a homicide suspect to the lockup. And I always, you know, when I, when I expressed an interest in going into law enforcement, my dad was absolutely not. You're going to go to college. You're going to major in business. You're going to get out, get a great job, get married, have 2.4 kids and live happily ever after. But that's what my dad wanted me to do. Mm-hmm. And so I had a choice when I graduated from college. My dad was dying of cancer. And I could have said, sorry, dad, I'm going to go blaze my own trail. Or out of love and respect for him, I could do what I did. If you look at my resume, my first two jobs were in business. You mentioned uh, mm-hmm. I, I was a marketing executive for Wendy's. And then I was a hospital administrator. And I sort of joke. I did what every good son did. Waited till my father passed away. And I found my passion. I, I pursued my calling and that was law enforcement. Hey, it's your imaginary best friend, Finch. And I know at times life can seem hard and you can feel stuck with no valuable answers and nowhere to go. Listen, I have a host of secrets and recipes that will not only help you enhance your lifestyle, career, relationships, and finances, but also help get your ass off the fence. And just because you're not where you want to be doesn't mean you're not where you're supposed to be. So let's go do the work. This episode starts now. My guest tonight is a former college basketball player who now motivates and helps people with self-development and mental health. He has a rich, diverse work history as he's been a marketing executive, a hospital administrator, and even, get this, ladies and gentlemen, a SWAT team hostage negotiator. That sounds fun, right? (laughs) But the greatest triumph, perhaps, has been his starring role as a cancer warrior. He's the author of Sustainable Excellence, 10 Principles to Leading Your Uncommon and Extraordinary Life. And guess what? He's here to help you get your ass off the fence. And we're getting one-on-one with him right now. It's Terry Tucker right now. Terry, how you doing, buddy? I'm great, Finch. Thanks for having me on. I'm looking forward to talking with you. Likewise, likewise. So, so I found it very interesting learning that you was a SWAT negotiator. Like I seen this. One of my favorite movies is The Negotiator with Kevin Spacey and Samuel L. Jackson. And that's the first thing I thought about when I read that he was a SWAT team negotiator. You got to tell us how that came into play. Like what? Because you you've had. It sounds like you've had. Uh, quite a few uh, backgrounds when it comes to jobs or, th- or positions you've held. How did you come across being a SWAT team negotiator? Well, I, you know, if you you got to understand the backstory, and, and there is a backstory. My my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, was a Chicago police officer from 1924 to 1954. So he was in Chicago during Prohibition when alcohol was outlawed during the Great Depression in the late 20s, early 30s. And when, you know, Al Capone and those guys were shooting up the town and he was actually shot in the line of duty with his own gun, taking a a homicide suspect to the lockup. And I always, you know, when I, when I expressed an interest in going into law enforcement, my dad was absolutely not. You're going to go to college. You're going to major in business. You're going to get out, get a great job, get married, have 2.4 kids and live happily ever after. But that's what my dad wanted me to do. And so I had a choice when I graduated from college. My dad was dying of cancer and I could have said, sorry, dad, I'm going to go blaze my own trail or out of love and respect for him. I could do what I did. If you look at my resume, my first two jobs were in business. You mentioned uh, Mm -hmm. I I was a marketing executive for Wendy's and then I was a hospital administrator. And I sort of joke, I did what every good son did, waited till my father passed away and I found my passion. I I pursued my calling and that was law enforcement. So Mm. I was a 37 year old rookie police officer when I started that journey. And I'd always been associated with the best or wanted to be associated with the best. So when there was an opportunity on the SWAT team to be for, for negotiator, I put in for it. I went through the physical training. I went through the psychological assessments. I went through all the, you know, interviews with the different people uh-huh. And eventually got on to to the to the team, and it was it was just an amazing experience 
uh, to be part of that. And, you know, I, I guess what people don't understand is that, you know, SWAT is kind of broken up into two groups, tactical, uh-huh. which are the men and women who, you know, have all the big guns and all that stuff and the negotiators. And we're, we're the smart ones. We're usually in a mobile home with a bathroom and, you know, climate controlled and drinks and all that kind of stuff. Right. Whereas these guys are laying underneath a bush somewhere, you know, and that. So <laughs> it, it just made more sense to be a negotiator than be on the tactical side. So, so what were some of the things that went into you becoming a hostage negotiator? Because when you think about hostage situation, you're talking, you're talking about someone who's t- taken by force, someone unwilling uh, to be captive, and now you have to negotiate their release. And so you talked about some of the tests that you had to take. Uh, walk us through some of those. What do some of those things entail um, so that we have a good idea of what type of, of people are chosen to be? Uh, hostage negotiators because not everybody is, is chosen to do that. Well, not everybody wants to do it. I mean, right. and, and that's you know, and and so it. I guess a probably a better a better term would be crisis negotiator because not only was it people who who had taken hostages, but it was somebody who barricaded themselves. Uh, okay, you know that I, I'll, I'll 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 give you two funny stories. Um, one was with uh, I, I I was working that particular night and I got to the scene and I was talking to the to the district officers. I'm like, what's the deal? It's like well, he's drunk. He's buried himself. <coughs> excuse me. He's barricaded himself inside the house with a gun and his wife. I said, do you have him on the phone? He's like, yeah, we do. So I started talking to him. <coughs> excuse me. And I, I said to him after a while, and usually you don't do this. Usually it's a couple hours before you talk about what it would take to come out. But I just kind of had a feeling. And so I said to him, what would it take for you to come out right now? And he said, give me a beer. I said, (laughs) if I gave you a beer, do I have your word you would come out? He said, do I have your word you'd let me drink it? I said, yeah, you have my word. I said, so I I gave $5 to one of the, the beat officers. I said, go down to the store, buy a beer. The tactical team put it on the front porch. And and I called them back and I said, hey, your beer's on the front porch, but you don't get it until your wife comes out, you put the gun down and you come out with your hands up. All of a sudden, the front front door flies open. Here comes his wife. Here he comes with his hands up. We handcuff him, let him drink his beer and off to jail he goes. So, (laughs) I I mean, that that was not a typical negotiation situation. And the other story I'll tell you, it was kind of tragic, but kind of interesting at the same time. This individual wanted to commit suicide. And so he had cut his wrists. This started about eight o'clock at night. He cut mm-hmm. his wrists and that didn't work. And for some reason, he thought it was smart to turn on the gas in his stove and to put his head in the oven. And wow. that, that, that didn't work either. And now he had a gun. And so he called a relative and the relative was smart enough to call the police. And so we're there. I'm, I'm negotiating with him. And it's probably about four o'clock in the morning now. And mm-hmm. so he says to me, you know, I'd really like to come out. And I said, well, why don't you do that? Just put the gun down come out, do what the tactical officers tell you to do. And then I'll come to the scene and we'll talk face to face. He's like, okay, I'd like that. I said, but don't hang up the phone. Well, he ends up hanging up the phone because it's natural instinct when we finish a call to do that. And so about 15 seconds later, one of the tactical officers comes on the radio and says, we heard a gunshot. And I thought, oh my God, this guy shot himself. He did. Shot himself in the head, shot himself in the temple, but he shot himself at such an angle where the bullet went in underneath his skin went around his scalp and came out the other side, never penetrated his skull, never got to his brain. So here's three times this individual wanted to commit suicide wow. and three times that he failed. And fortunately he lived. So, so those were kind of the, the, the things we dealt with. I mean, we took all kinds of ty- psychological tests. We mm-hmm. met with a psychologist. We, we took all kinds of uh, paper, you know, answer these questions and things like that. And, and then it was just a matter of the psychologist saying, yes, this person has the mindset to do it, or no, you probably shouldn't put this person in it. And then there were a lot of interviews. They talked to your old bosses and, mm-hmm. you know, does this person make, would, would you think this person make a good negotiator? So that's kind of how we got into it. Wow. First of all, <laughs> like when I hear this, I'm saying to myself, well, Terry's been getting people off the fence for a very long time. I mean, when you think about it, it and, and just, you know, uh, because negotiation, uh, uh, negotiating, whether it's a crisis situation, a terrorist situation, or or whatever the case may be, 
um, that is someone on the fence about which direction they want to go in. And they haven't made a, a definitive choice yet, which is why they're sitting on the fence. And here you come along with your skill sets to help them manage the crisis that they are that they either have created or they find themselves in. And that sounds like a lot about what you do now as a motivator, as a, uh, a life coach or a motivator. Um, and I have to ask having such a, uh, diverse background in, in a host of things you've done, because I'm pretty sure working as a marketing executive wasn't the same as working as a hospital administrator. And that wasn't the same as working as a SWAT team hostage <laughs> negotiator. And, and so when you look at your path um, and the, well, the path you've taken and how you charted your course and your journey, uh, what are some of the things you think contribute to your desire to now want to help other people get their ass off the fence? All the things that I've seen, all the things that I've done in my life, you know, I've always felt that, you know, I, I, I'm going to be. I'm going to be till the day I die a lifelong learner. I want to learn new things. I want to understand things. And I, you know, I, I started out at Wendy's. I didn't know anything about marketing. And and you know, here I was in the heyday of fast food. You know, when this little uh, former beauty operator from Chicago was running around on on the Wendy's commercial saying, "Where's the beef?" <laughs> you know, and, and some of your audience may remember that. Well, I was at Wendy's when that happened. And and so I got to be involved in some really exciting times there. And then I went to work for a large hospital, 5,000 employees, 1,100 beds, and learned a lot about, you know, the, the different aspects of healthcare. And then, like I said, made this major pivot. And I think that made me it gave me some life experience to be a police officer. It, uh -huh. it, you know, I would, and, and people always ask me today, especially young people who want to go into the profession, what do you recommend? And what I always tell them is put your phone down, put your devices down and go out on the street and talk to the homeless guy and go mm -hmm. up to the penthouse and talk to that guy. Because if you can talk to people, if you have the ability to communicate and you have the ability to realize when people are, you know, giving you a bunch of garbage, it's like, no, right. no, that's just a flat out lie. And I know that. And if you can do that, you, you're a good cop. If you can't talk to people, you're not going to be effective in that job. And, and that's a shame because, you know, I didn't become a police officer to, you know, sort of kick ass and take names. I became uh -huh. a police officer because I wanted to help people because I wanted to make right. a difference in my community. And, you know, being a cop today, not, not something that most people aspire to, uh -huh. but the people who, you know, who go around and I used to talk to kids in the police Academy when we would be down there for SWAT training. And I used to tell them, you know, they're going to spend six months teaching you how to use all these tools on your belt. But the two most important tools you bring to this job are this, your brain and this, your mouth, because I've seen, you know, people, depending on how they talk to other people, turn yes people into no people and conversely turn no people into yes people. I think the, the two biggest things you bring to this job, you already bring, but if you have right. some life experience to back it up, you're going to be that much more effective. Yeah. And it's so odd that you say that because I was watching this program today and this is something that we, I think uh, a lot of people uh, have dealt with when it can't, when it comes to police officer. And it's so vitally important when you're talking about listening, having the ability to listen and communicate effectively, not just talk at people, but being able to communicate effectively. And it's one of the things I was asking a question actually today, uh, before the show, when it comes to, uh, certain police officers and you, you really just, uh, hit the nail on the, on the head is I was asking the question about, uh, it was a scene in this, uh, on this show where, uh, a black guy was out of his car and he was trying to guard. He was actually a bodyguard, private security, uh, guarding a news anchor. And the news anchor started running because he had to get to the station for a story. And they was caught in traffic in New York City. And these two officers approached the guy and he's trying to explain to them who he is. And they're not listening. And I said, why is that so oddly uh, uh, the, the case when it comes to a host of police officers in today's time where people are trying to tell them things or communicate things to them and they're not listening. And I think when you just said that it, it now makes a lot of sense because we're, I think as people, we're looking at them as police officers. We're just, we're not looking at them as human beings who have problems with communication and listening. 
Because because that's really what it is, right? It, it's not necessary because they have on a uniform. It's right. like no, no. I'm pretty sure if this guy's married, he's not listening to his wife, and you know he he's he's not communicating in a way that he needs to communicate at home with his kids, with his coworkers. And so it's re- really in my answer, I said that's not a police problem. That's a people problem because oftentimes we don't listen and we don't know how to effectively communicate um, to either divert a situation to diffuse a situation and sometimes because of what we've been taught all we know how to do is inflame something because we're speaking from a place of how we feel versus looking at the whole scope of, of, of things in that in that order and i think i think that's a really great uh skill set that you you've taught people that they need because you not only need that on, on your job you need that in real everyday life right you do, and and and, I, and and I'll be the first to tell you that a lot of times as police officers, we're our own worst enemy. You know, mm-hmm. I, I can recall uh, one night we were look, there was a, there was an armed robbery. We were looking for a, a Ford Bronco. It was white in color, and two of these officers pulled over a light colored. It wasn't white uh-huh. Ford Bronco with four black guys in it. And you know, they go up to the car. It is not the people we're looking for. And the driver kept asking. We we got there to back them up. The driver kept asking, why did you pull me over? Now, this is a classic, you pull me over because I'm black. Right, no, right. we pulled you over because your vehicle roughly matched the description of somebody that we're looking for in an armed robbery. Now, I remember the, the guy kept, he kept going out the window and, and the cops that were there was like, why'd you stop us? Why'd you stop us? Why? And and the cops were like, yeah, you don't need to know that. Just go on. I'm like, oh my God, you idiot. Just tell them why you stopped them. You know, I mean, it's not hard. There's a legitimate right. reason why you were stopped. And if yeah. we do a better job of communicating that, and you make a good point, you know, the importance of listening to understand versus listening to respond. Right, you know, right. and I, as a police officer, you know, I have certain authority with that badge and that gun and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. a lot of cops sort of like, well, do it because I said to do it. Yeah, you know, that's not an right. effect. You wouldn't right. say that to your wife. You right. Know, do that because I told you to do it. Well, they you know, might. <laughs> well, you might. You're, you're not going to be married very long, probably. But, you know, <laughs> but explain to them, look, I need you to do this. And here's why. You know, I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm not. This is right. for your safety or the safety of your family. And if we would just do a better job of listening to understand as opposed to listening to reply, I, I think we'd get along better as police and citizens. Yeah. M- maybe they, th- they thought that Bronco was OJ. <laughs> yeah. There you go. That's what we did. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's the OJ all over again. Yeah. Right. No. <laughs> That's hilarious. All right. So, so you have this thing and uh, you ask, you pose this question. Do you want, an uncommon and extraordinary life? And I think that's a huge question. Uh, And I want my friends to uh, uh, have this conversation with us. So I'm going to bring my friends in. um, And and this is so great because we we all love uh, having these types of conversations. So please welcome to Off the Fence, my friend, Dr. V. Hi. Hey, how you doing, Terry? I'm good. How are you? I'm about 2,000%. It's a great day in the neighborhood. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Rogers. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'll take, <laughs> I'll take it. Great day in the neighborhood. Great right. day in the neighborhood. So, so, hey, guys, he has this huge question that he asks his people. And I got to ask everybody here this question. Do you want an uncommon and extraordinary life? And Terry, I have to ask, where did that come from? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I I don't I don't know where that come from. I I, I you know it, it was just something that I thought you know why do we want a mediocre life? Why do we want an average life? We were born to be uncommon and extraordinary, and so many people settle for ordinary and common mm-hmm. when we're all born for something better than that. And and I I just got to a point where it was like, why wouldn't you want that? If that's what you were born for, why wouldn't you want it? Why would you settle for something less than your best? So I, I guess it was just kind of something I was thinking about one day and sort of that's how it came about. All right. That's how it came out. Um, and I think that that's kind of the, the question. You know, if you if you could choose and you could have uncommon and extraordinary, why then would you choose 
mediocre or are unfulfilling. And I think it goes back to what we was talking about just a moment ago, uh, as you was talking about the things you 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 teach people and and police officer. It's what's in our head, I think, um, that registers or doesn't register as to the type of choices we will make in our lives. And I because, and I think sometimes, and and my friends, uh, y'all back me up or not on this. Why do you think people choose the opposite? Is it because we is is it because we just don't know there's better, or we don't know how to get better? Wh- which one do you guys think that is? I think it's a combination. You know, one of my favorite scriptures is God will give you exceedingly and abundantly above all you can ask or think. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, I got a heck of an imagination. This thing is going to be really live. Uh (laughs) So, (laughs) so that's, that's how we were taught. But if you were not taught that and what you see is just making the ends meet, just getting by. Then sense. we assimilate to what is familiar, right? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And so just opening up your mind to all of the possibilities. And and even you think about it, even in school, they teach you about these, these are the vocations that you can go into, right? Mm-hmm. It's not like that. You can be a hostage negotiator, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, right. So I think it's familiarity and then sometimes a little bit of fear too. Um and I think that's how it shapes us sometimes. I agree. I agree. Yeah. All right, y'all got questions here? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, mm-hmm. he, that, that's that's a very interesting career. I was wondering when you're in these these hostile environments and how, and you know, I, I'm assuming that well, I know that it that it can be some very hostile environments. How do you turn it off once you clock out? That's a, that's a great question. And, and for me, you know, I, I've seen people I've worked with commit suicide, you know, turn to the bottle, turn to drugs, turn, turn to those kind of things. And I certainly had the opportunity, you know, shifts over. Hey, we're all going out to the bar. Why don't you come with us? And, and I never did that. And I can honestly say never, not once did I ever go out to the bar after a shift because what grounded me, what, what got me to be able to get up the next morning and go do that was my family. You know, I, I wanted to go home. I wanted to be with my wife. I wanted to be with my daughter. I wanted to be in in a calming, loving, caring situation. And it, it going out to a bar and, you know, drowning my sorrows after, you know, I, you know, one night, Friday night, my, my partner and I responded on a noise run to the, a single mom with two kids, two little kids, two cute, unbelievably cute kids. And then we were off on the weekend and Saturday night, that woman drowned her two sons in the bathroom. Oh, wow. Wow. And, and, wow. and you know, you read wow. about it in the paper on Sunday and you're like, oh my, oh my God, I just talked to that woman the night before. And did I miss something? Did I, you know, was there something right. I could have done that prevented mm-hmm. that? And, right. uh, you know, and I, st- I still see those kids running around their, the apartment to this day. Wow. And, and it's like, you know, but no, my sanctuary is I'm going to hug my wife and I'm going to hug my daughter a little tighter mm-hmm. because you see things as a first responder, as a as a military person that you shouldn't see, that you don't right. want to see. You see right. helplessness and hopelessness. And so my family was my grounding point. And mm-hmm. so I wanted to be with them and, and they, they kept me sane. They kept me going. I love it. Terry, I was telling Finch before um, we got on that I've been rereading the four agreements. And um, one of one of them, of course, is don't take it all personally. But I know that's very challenging in um, the professions that you've had. So I, I'm looking at your professions and they are very diverse. What do you think is your personal quality that is that thing that has sustained you in all of those. What what is it the what's the part of you that makes you able to cover that type of ground? I, I really think it was my background, the way the way I grew up. I, I am you, you can't tell this from looking at me, but I'm six foot eight inches tall, and I played wow. college basketball at the Citadel. I've got a brother who's six foot seven who was a pitcher for Notre Dame, and another brother who's six foot six who was drafted by the Cleveland Cavaliers in the National Basketball Association. And then my dad was 6'5". So, I, I, I mean, you know, I was short sort of Short guy. He's yeah. a short guy. Yeah. If you sat behind our family in church growing up, not a prayer's chance you were going to see anything <laughs> that was going on, you know, at, at, at all. 
but you know, our five foot eight inch mother was, was the boss. But what, what my parents taught us was the importance of family and the importance of what family means, loving, caring, supporting, nurturing each other. And my parents, you know, did what I call divide and conquer parenting, where it'd be like, okay, Terry's got a game over here. Dad's going to that. Larry's got to practice over here. Mom's going to that. And Brian's going with them for that. So we were always running in a million different directions. And I remember when my my dad was dying of cancer and I, I was living at home after college, I, I was working at Wendy's. And I remember one night, my youngest brother was in high school at a basketball game. And I said to my dad, I said, you know, it's been a couple of days since I worked out. I'm not going to go to Brian's game. I, I'm going to, I'm going to go work out. And, and my dad's like, no, you're not. And I'm like, you know, I was kind of like, what do you mean? No, I'm not. I'm an adult. I have my own job. I mean, what do you mean? You're telling me I'm not going to, you know, it's like, no, our family has always been about loving, caring and supporting each other. Your brother needs you right now. Your brother needs you to be there to support him. And my dad was right. I mean, I, I found another time to go work out and I ended up going to my brother's game, but my parents taught us that. And, and that has just been such a huge part of, of the way I, you know, involve my wife and my daughter. Family is, is it, you know, I, I told you that's how I got through all those times in, in law enforcement because I had a strong family dynamic and that's, that's what got me there. Love it. I'm also talking about, I, I love that. I'm a family girl. Uh, my mom just turned 82. Outstanding. On, yeah. On, on Monday. And we had 35 people for dinner on Sunday. So, you know, but because she's the matriarch of our family, so I'm, I'm there. Um, I'm, I'm also looking for your personal quality. Am I, I heard you talk about communication. I heard you talk about, um, just your how that led you into negotiation. What's your personal quality besides your family love that would make you um, just this person that can go through all of these different situations? I, I would have to answer that by saying my faith. I, I, okay. I've always had a, a very strong faith in God. And, you know, when I got cancer, you know, people were like, well, who do you blame? Like, what do you mean? Who do I blame? Well, you got to blame. And we're great, you know, as a society of, you know, we start down a road towards a goal and then we butt up against an impediment, an obstacle, and we quit and we give up. But we just don't do that. We, we want to blame somebody. You know, we got to blame our parents or our station in life or our boss or, or whoever it is. And so people were trying to get me to like, well, well, who do you blame because you got cancer? I'm like, I don't blame anybody. And then it turned to, well, you got to blame God. And, and so I used to joke. I'm like, no, I don't think God got up on a Tuesday morning, checked his to-do list and said, Terry Tucker, cancer today. I, 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 don't think, <laughs> I don't think that happened at all. But what I think God has done is giving me the strength to get through what I've been through. And, and I was on a drug called interferon early on in my cancer journey mm -hmm. that gave me severe flu-like symptoms for yes. two to three days every week after yes. each injection. Right. And I took those weekly injections for five years. Mm -hmm. And I remember being at a point where it was like, God, I am so sick of being sick. Yes. Please let me go. Please take me out of this mess. Well, yes. he didn't, but he gave me the strength to continue in that yes. mess. I got it. Thank you so much. I I'm loving it. I'm almost ready to play basketball and negotiate and everything. And I'm five one on a good day. So we four eleven. Come on. Come on, tell the truth. Hey, B, get your ass off the fence about your height. I, I know, I know, I know. I don't think I'll ever do that. It's just it's too hard. It's too hard. All right. So so when Terry, when you talk about uh truth. And, and I, I know crazy part about our society is we always say we want the truth, but uh, oftentimes we, we're not able to, or I ain't going to say able to, because everybody I believe has the ability to do it, but we don't want to digest truth. And I think oftentimes when we're on the fence about life, career, relationship, or even our money, we're not looking at the truth that we Oh, we're, we're not looking at the lies we tell ourselves mm. um, because we don't want to hear the truth about where we are. Because like you said a moment, it's it's so easy for us to blame people versus blaming ourselves or looking at ourselves and realizing, hey, I'm living 
the life I'm living or I'm not living the life I desire because of myself. Uh, and, and, and I always say, I think it stems from how we think because how we think affects what we speak, what we mm-hmm. speak and, and what we think and what we speak affects how we act. It, it, it affects mm-hmm. our actions. And Absolutely. so when, we, when you start looking at all of the ingredients that we utilize or don't utilize in order to be successful or to live an extraordinary life or an uncommon life, as you say it, what is one truth that you would tell people that would assist them in getting their ass off the fence about where they are in their lives right now in order to live an uncommon life or to have an extraordinary life? Because a lot of people desire that. They just don't know how to get it started. So let's help them jump start it right now. What's one truth you would tell them? Before I tell you this truth, let, let me just say this. And, and, and I wish I had said this, this saying, but I, I didn't, this is not mine, but you talked about, you know, what we think and, and what I've found in life. And, I, and I've certainly done this. And I think most of us have, it's easier to judge than it is to think. So we judge people, we judge circumstances, we judge our finances, we judge our health. We do all that because we don't want to think about it, or it's too hard to think about it. So it's easier to judge than it is to think. But in terms of of truth, I, I have I have four truths that I've come to over this ten year cancer journey, and 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 I'll give you the first one because I think it would probably answer that. You need to control your mind, or your mind is going to control you. And I, when I was in high school, I had three knee surgeries, and I remember when I went back playing basketball after that. My mind was putting all kinds of negative thoughts into my brain. You know, things like, mm-hmm. hey, you're probably a step slower and college coaches aren't going to be interested in wanting to recruit you. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm still playing at an elite level and college coaches are still reaching out about the possibility of playing for their college or university. So I realized I had to flip the switch to something positive. Yes. And if you think about it, we have 60 to 70,000 thoughts that pass through our brain every day, many of which we don't even pay attention to. But your brain, your mind can only hold one thought at a time. Mm -hmm. Why would you want to make that a negative thought? So I I, I think it's real important to control the thoughts that are in our minds. Because if we don't, it's kind of like that old saying, we become what we think. So if you're thinking negative, if you're thinking you're never going to be successful, you're right. And people have said that to me. They kind of come up, Terry, I could never go through what you've gone through. And Sometimes I can be a smart aleck. So, yeah, and so, you know, so sometimes I'll be, I'll be like, yeah, you're right. You couldn't because you've already decided you already in your mind it. that you can't be successful at this. Why would you start anything thinking you weren't going to be successful? Mm-hmm. Right. I got to follow up to that. What's a practical way someone could control their mind? Because I, I, I say this to people all the time, Terry, in just passing com- uh, conversations I've, I've having with people. I'm realizing that people don't realize they have more control over certain things about their themselves and their lives than they've given themselves credit for. And so people will probably say, well, well, I don't know how to control my mind because all I hear is these voices and and all these things. And it's it's telling me to do this. It's telling me to do this. So what would you say would be a practical way someone could control their mind? I think that's a great question. And, And I think you have to, just like anything else, in order to change something, you have to understand it. You have to realize that it's there. It's okay to have negative thoughts. Negative thoughts are going to creep into your brain and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And when they do, you have to realize that, oh, mm, I don't like that thought. That's a negative thought. And then you need to change the narrative. You need to flip that to something more positive. Oh, I'm going to start this business. You're never going to be successful at that. Wait a minute. Hey, I'm going to start this business and it's going to make a hundred thousand dollars in the first year. You got to flip that switch. And if you do that, Every time you're cognizant of that negative thought, right. eventually your brain starts to focus on the positive things and less on the negative things. Terry, you, I want to roll back. You said um, we judge as opposed to thinking. Now, put those two side by side for me and then tell us a differential. I, I don't know. I, I, let, me, let, me, let me think of something. I mean, I guess I, yeah, I mean, we were talking about, you know, the whole police and, and black community relations and stuff. You know, okay. all, all cops are, you know, all, all cops are going to shoot black people. Okay. Well, if you look at the statistics, the truth is that's not the truth. I, I mean, there are millions of encounters with, with citizens every year. I mean, the, the odds of you getting shot and killed by the police are like 0.000046. So 
if you if you understand that, I mean, we're not all bad, and, and you know, and that there there are some bad, absolutely, totally get that in mm-hmm. any profession, mm-hmm. and we try to weed them out. And I can tell you, I did that. We did that as a, you know, in a in a in a relief. It's like, yeah, that guy shouldn't be a cop. I mean, you need to go. You need you need to get it. And and over time, we would weed those people out because you don't want that. So understand that it's easier for me to judge. I, I you know, all cops are bad. Well, no, all cops aren't bad. That's the truth. The truth is, all cops aren't bad. Just like you know, all all priests aren't pedophiles. You know, most pe- priests are good, decent people. So it's easier to judge. It's easier to make a snap decision than it is to think based on facts or circumstances th- that are are true. And I guess a fact is true. Okay. That's kind of redundant. But if it's a fact, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's I kind th- of what came to mind. I think so. So in the first truth, in your first truth, controlling your mind has also to do with dispelling bias, basically, is what you're saying, because you have to control that part in order to come to yep. like an even positive way to move forward. Basically. And and I think if you st- if we stop labeling people, you know, we stop saying, "Oh, that's a cop," or "or that's a black person." Or that, we're all people, you know. We have more in common with each other than we have differences. I agree with and, you. And and if we would spend more time, again, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier about you know listening to understand versus listening. Or and maybe I didn't maybe I didn't say this earlier. I'm sorry. I did a podcast earlier where I said this exact same thing. Where as a negotiator, you know, we're listening to understand where are you coming from, as opposed to, you know, Finch, hurry up and say what you're going to say because I want to get my two cents in. That's right. Listening to respond. And right. nobody wins in that situation. Right. Where we win is if I, oh, Finch, you know, you said something and I may agree with it. I may not agree with it, but let's talk about it. Where, where are you coming from with that? Right. That's we can get so much done if we would listen that way, as opposed to listening or screaming at each other and saying, "Oh yeah, hey, I'm listening because I want to get my two cents in." I, I agree. I agree. So Terry, I got a quick question around that. So how when you say listening to understand, was that a learned skill for you, or was that something that you felt like you were born naturally with? I, I think that I've. That's a that's a learned skill. I, I, a lot of what I learned as as a negotiator, you know, I, I didn't. I, I'll never forget. You know, I, I I get onto the team and we're at our first training session, and 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 we we train by role playing. We had a psychologist that worked with us, and and it's a, a barricaded subject has got a hostage behind a locked door, and I'm negotiating with them. And the hostage is, you know, the whole time the hostage is like, help me, help me, help, you know. And, and I spent my entire time focusing on the hostage, you know, like, Hey, it's going to be okay. Don't worry. We're going to get you out. And And I totally negated the hostage taker. And so I had to learn. It's like, you just got to forget about the hostage. I don't care if they're bleeding. I don't care. Your focus is on the the hostage taker. So it it was a learned skill. The other thing that was, that was learned, and, and this is very hard for all of us to do is the importance of silence and using silence to our advantage. So I may, you know, say I'm negotiating with Finch and I, you know, I say, hey, Finch, you know, why are we here today? And and Finch, you know, he's all fired up and he's talking, he's talking, he's talking. Well, then he stops talking. And see how comfortable that, unpre- that you know, sort of pregnant pause is where nobody's mm-hmm. saying anything. Mm-hmm. We, we want to fill that space. Mm-hmm. And we had to be good at not saying anything of just sitting there because what's going to happen is the hostage taker or the barricaded person, they're going to start filling it. They're going to start right. talking again. And exactly. that's what we wanted. We wanted them to burn off that emotional energy so that their rational side would start to take over because we make better decisions with our rational brain than we do with our emotional brain. Mm-hmm. You learned some of that in your family too, though, yeah. in your family situation. Because I noticed when you're at dinner, you know, when everybody's at dinner and they're really talking all the life situations come up and we learn how to um, do exactly what you're doing, but we learn it in a comfortable environment. Yeah. yeah a non-threatening environment. It's yes, not exactly. scary. It's good. Yeah. Right. You're right. Mm-hmm. That's true. That's true. All right. So uh, what would be uh, truth number two? So truth number two is embrace the pain and the difficulty that we all experience in life and use that pain and difficulty 
to make you a stronger individual. So we know our brains just from, you know, the, the time of man are hardwired to avoid pain and discomfort and to seek pleasure. So to, to the, the average person, we don't like pain. We want to run from it. We want to get away from it. And people do. And they run to, like we just talked about, a bottle or drugs or behavior that isn't in their best interest. And so I always recommend it. And, and I do this every day of my life. I try to do something that is scary, that makes me uncomfortable, that makes me nervous, that is potentially embarrassing. Because if you do that stuff every day, if you do, and it doesn't have to be big. I mean, like today, I, I hate going to the dentist. But today I picked up the phone and I you know, it's like, oh, okay, I got to make my six-month appointment. Yeah, it's not a big deal, but it's a little bit uncomfortable. You know, hey, I, I, I want to go run tomorrow. You know, I, yeah, but I'm going to be late for work. I got this. We'll get up an hour early. Oh, that's a little uncomfortable. Whatever that ends up being, if you do those small things in life every day that make you uncomfortable, when the big stuff in life hits, when we, you know, you lose somebody that's close to you, you lose your job, you're living out of our car. I mean, we've all heard the stories. If you do those small things every single day, you're going to be so much more resilient to handle pain when it comes your way. And so I guess what I'm saying with this is instead of running from pain, Take it, flip it inside of you, burn it as fuel, use it as energy to make you a more resilient individual. I cry every day, some type of way, like e- every purpose? day o- on purpose. Either I cry laughing, I cry if something is bothering me, I cry if I, I cry sometimes when I'm praying. It's some type of, it's some type of kind of release kind of like for me. And so it, it happens. Just about, I would say just about every day. Wow. In some type of way. It's just part of my emotional balance, I guess. I'm not laying on the floor. Well, I have been laying on the floor, but you get what I'm saying. Like, it's it's some part of of that. It it helps me kind of balance. Dr. Lee, you're not alone. JB cries every day. Now, he'll never tell you guys that, but (laughs) he cries every day. See, look, right he's now the tears are about to come Kleenex, out. Right? You yeah. know, he's got stock in Kleenex. Yeah. Tears about, about to come right, out right, right now. Go right. ahead and finish laughing, JB. It's okay. <laughs> Let him out, man. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. We, we still love you, dude. All right? Fish does not have the sense God gave him. I, clear, I promise he doesn't. <laughs> I could be writing and be crying, Finch. Like I'm writing something, like I'm writing the vlog or whatever, and it makes that thought just gives gives me that life. I have to push it out. That's I've got to push it out. Got to get it out. Got to get it out. All right. Uh, so embrace the pain and difficult that we all experience. Tara, I tell people all the time, you know, one thing about this life that we live, and it doesn't matter which uh, which part of the scale that you're on. Adversity is is something that nobody avoids Mm -hmm. in this life. Mm -hmm. Everybody is faced with some form of adversity at some point in their life. And Mm -hmm. people always think that because somebody has a certain level of money or prestige or or fortune or fame, that they escape adversity for some... Mm -hmm. They they have the resources and tools to manage that adversity a lot better, but nobody... It's it's almost like death. Nobody gets out of life alive. Everybody's Mm -hmm. going to have to die at some point, you know? Um, But when you talk about embracing the pain, what would be a truth number... uh, uh, Another truth that you would tell someone in order for them to... They say, man, I'm on the fence. I'm not sure. I don't like the life I have. I know I want more, but I don't. I just don't know how to get it. And because I, I believe here, a lot of us want an extraordinary life. We want something extraordinary than the life that. Because can we be honest for just a second? Since we're just friends, okay. Let's be honest. None of us. Well, let me ask the question, Terry. Did you choose who your parents would be? No. No. So none of us got a chance to choose where we started in life. But I believe you have the ability to choose where you go in life and you have to make a choice. And so with someone that's sitting on the fence right now and they say, "Okay, all right, Mr. Tucker, Mr. Hostage Negotiate, I heard your one truth about controlling my mind. All right. You make some great points. Okay, I heard embrace the pain, ball it up and fuel it, use it a few. Okay, what else do you have for me that's going to help me get off this fence so that I don't have to. I've been believing all this time that 
the 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 common life I've been living, I had to I had to uh, settle for it because you know say hey just 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 be okay with it. That's another mindset we're taught to just be okay with mm. mediocre uh, mediocrity. Just be okay with just barely making. Just be okay with living paycheck to check paycheck. And here you come along, Mr. Tucker, and say, hey, that's not the life Mm-mm. you have to uh, subscribe Mm-mm. to. So what, what, what's another truth you would tell our audience? Well, before I go to the next truth, let me just add something to that, because I think you hit on a really good point about adversity. And, and, and here's what I'd say about that. We're all going to experience pain in our lives. And, and, you know, and it doesn't have to be like me, like a cancer pain or even any kind of an illness. You could, you know, break up with your boyfriend or your girlfriend or, you know, not get the promotion at work that you think you deserve or, you know, have a fender bender on the way to work, whatever. Pain is inevitable in our lives. Suffering, suffering, on the other hand, that'd be optional. Suffering is optional because it's what you do with that pain. Do you take that pain and use it to make you a stronger and more determined individual? Or do you wallow in it and feel sorry for yourself and want people to feel sorry for you? It's a choice. Everything in life is a choice. Life's not going to give you anything just because of who you are. And Mm -hmm. I've always believed that whatever you need to be successful in life, however you define that word, is already inside you. You just need to find it, pull it out, and use it to your advantage. So I would say, Terry, what about the pain that JB feels every night when his wife steals the Oreo cookies from the refrigerator? Now, now that's a pain that nobody can get over. (laughs) I'll tell you that right now. I mean, those are Oreo cookies, man. Those are special. (laughs) Amen. I think you got a T-shirt over there, Terry, because I saw it. Like pain is inevitable, suffering is an option. Yeah. Ah. uh, That's that's. I think that's a real T-shirt. And and I, I have a story about that, Finch. Like. In, in in my writing, when he's talking about embr- embracing the pain of your life, I, there were certain incidents that I didn't want to really just, I dealt with them, quote unquote, but I didn't want to talk about them because that would bring me closer to it. Yeah. And now I'm finding as I'm writing in this last book, I'm, I'm writing about my life domestic with the domestic violence. I'm writing about my life with um, caretaking and you know, everybody growing over, I'm literally writing about it. And every time I share one part of that blog, the response is huge, Mm -hmm. but that's because now I'm able to turn it in and and let it go because it's really built for somebody to help somebody else too. Mm -hmm. But it was a hard, it's a hard road to get there. It's hard road. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know what? It it amazes me when you were just talking about adversity here, how, the lifts that people will go to to avoid the adversity. Mm-hmm. I, I, I talk to guys all the time and, you know, especially when we're talking about on the subject of marriage mm-hmm. and guys will go all around the world, do all kinds of, I mean, spend tons of energy avoiding conflict instead of just <laughs> going right into it. And it's just like, man, it, it, the, the amount of energy that and time that you just took avoiding it, you could have just used half of that and just had the discussion. Right. And gotten at least halfway to the to the clarity that you need or to the healing that you needed. And so it's I mean that that that's that it really amazes me every time I hear those kind of stories. I mean, but you're right though, it's inevitable. So you might as well just go ahead and walk towards it. It, it is. And if you if you look at like I and, and I'll give my when I go for my treatments, you know, I have there's two ways to look at me having to go to be infused with a drug that makes me throw up and shake and have a fever and all this kind of stuff. I either have to go do it or I get to go do it. And if I have to go do it, it's like, and it's anything. I have to go to work today or do I get to go to work today? Right. I I have to be a coach today or do I get to be a coach today? And for me with what I do, it's it, this drug's probably not going to save my life, but it may save the life of somebody else down the road. So I'm willing to go through all this garbage, right? Not in a, I have to do it but more of a, I get to do it because maybe somebody down the road is going to benefit from this and it's going to save their life. I may not even know them. I may not even be alive, but for me, that's, I get to do it as opposed to, I have to do it. Mm -hmm. And you're part of the step for victory for a larger vision for you, for your community and your world. And I get that. I'm really in that space right now. Yep. That's good. All right. So, uh, truth number three, Terry, truth number three. Um, what you leave behind is what you weave in the hearts of other people. And I look at this kind of as a, a, a legacy truth. And yes. 
you know, I, I mean, I think it's important for all of us, regardless of what stage in life we are, to look at the end game. You right. know, what what do you want people to say about you at your funeral? You know, mm. I, I mean, what do you think people will say about you at your funeral? And when I when I found out after I had my leg amputated and I found out I had these tumors in my lungs, I went with my wife to the mortuary and to the cemetery and to our church and I planned my funeral. And because I come on these podcasts and, you know, I give talks on motivation and the need to keep moving forward, I got some brushback from people that were like, well, you know, don't you think that was kind of defeatist? And I, I yeah. kind of looked at them like, well, the last time I checked, I think we're all going to die. I don't think yeah. anybody's working on a cure for life right now. <laughs> so, you know, it's like everybody's going to die, but not everybody is really going to live. And I heard a Native American Blackfoot proverb years ago that goes like this. When you were born, you cried and the world rejoiced. Live your life. And I think that's the important words in this saying. Live your life in such a way so that when you die, the world cries and you rejoice. Absolutely. That's what I want. That's what I'm looking Absolutely. for. Don't get me wrong. I'm not looking to hasten my demise in any way. But I think <laughs> that's the important part of you know what you do with your life is what you, you know, you leave that behind. You, you're the ancestor. You set the table for the next generation. Right. How are you, you know, I mean, in America, that's not a big deal, but I do podcasts all over the world. Right. And in a lot of countries, ancestry is hugely important. It's you know? huge. It's you huge. You know, I mean, my grandparents set it for my parents. My parents set it for me. I'm setting it for my daughter. So I, I, I think it's important that, you know, how we live our lives is really it's not, it's not just that now, it's after we're gone, what examples are you setting? Are you ever too old to start, Terry? I, I don't think you're, you're ever told. So I, I don't care how bad your past is. I don't care how many sins you made. I don't care how bad you, know, you, you treated other people. You can't do anything about the past, but you can start from today right. and make the decision to move forward in a more positive way. I can't do anything about the past, but I yeah. certainly have a say in how the future goes. Yep. I love it. Yep. All right. And uh, truth number four. Truth number four, as long as you don't quit, you can never be defeated. And I think that's pretty self-explanatory. But the way that resonates with me is this. Someday my pain is going to end. It may end through surgery. It may end through some kind of a new medication. Quite frankly, it may end when I die. But if I quit, if I give up, if I give in to pain, the pain is always going to be a part of my life. Mm. Wow. I, I, um, yeah, you're about to make me cry, bud. So, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I mean, it's in there um, because that's the, the truth. Because I always would um, tell people around me, you say, well, I just don't want to get up today. Well, what's the option? <laughs> Yeah. Don't, if you don't get up and get in it, what's the option? You either got to live or die. And there really is um, not a good fence between deciding how you're going to do that. Yeah. yeah. What's the old Shawshank Redemption, you know, quote, get right. busy living or get busy dying. Get either yeah. one. Mm -hmm. Either one. Either one. Either one. Yeah. And, and Terry, I always tell people dreams are forever until you decide to give up and stop dreaming. That doesn't mean that everything you desire to be or become, you're going to be. Because yeah, at some point in my life, I wanted to play in the NFL and at some point in the NBA. I didn't well, know. that didn't did know not that. happen. But if I took that and I looked at that to be the totality of my life, not not getting those those dreams not coming to fruition, I would never have a top 200 podcast. I would never have traveled the world a couple of times. I would have never done any of the other things I've been, I've been afforded the opportunity to do. Or and led the football thing. You said what? Or led the football, you know, you did the, um, oh, yeah, yeah. 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 So you did it, some of it. Lead, but I, yeah. I, I, do, I do host yeah. uh, one of the biggest tailgates for college football every yes. year. Yes. You know? and, yeah. and, 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 and so again, I think oftentimes when you're looking at as long as you don't quit, you 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 can never be defeated. I, I equate that to your dream. Like like I, a, a good friend of mine, Hill Harper, taught me this a long time ago. As the architect of your own destiny, 
you should always draw out your plan in pencil because pencil has an eraser on it and you can make modifications as you go along. So let's say for instance, okay, football didn't happen for me uh, or this didn't happen for me. If I quit with this, that, those little dreams, you know, what else do I have the potential to become? And I think so many of you that's listening to this or watching this, I'm looking at, the things that you did not accomplish as failure. And you talked about this earlier, Terry, you know, if, if Terry gave up, I and mean, as he said a moment ago, if he gave in to the pain, where, what type of life would he have? He wouldn't, I can tell you right now, he would not have an extraordinary life and extraordinary by others. Definition is not necessarily extraordinary by the way he lives. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And I think so, so many times, especially in this, social media driven society we are basing our lives on the lives of others and the way that they are projecting that they're living because listen guys people are not living as good as they say on social media just just know that okay just know that there's a lot of people lying to you and so that's causing you to <laughs> want, well, number one terry not control your mind right. okay because your mind is racing about all these other things that people are doing that you feel like you're entitled to be doing, but you're not making choices. You're still sitting your ass on the fence. So you have to get off the fence. Uh, and I like that. So really quick for our audience, repeat those four truths here. So control your mind or your mind will control you. Embrace the pain and the difficulty that we all experience in life and use that to make you a stronger and more determined individual. Number three, what you leave behind is what you weave in the hearts of other people. And number four, as long as you don't quit, you can never be defeated. As long as you don't quit, you can never be defeated. I want to ask you a follow-up question to uh, number three. Mm -hmm. How important is it for people to leave a legacy? No matter what that mm -hmm. legacy is, because I think so. We, if, if we're really looking at what we're taught, we're taught a host of things in school, you know, uh, whether that be college, whether that be uh, a primary school, but how many, I, I, I can know I'm raising my hand. I wasn't taught anything in school or in my home about leaving a legacy. Well, y'all, I, I wasn't either. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, and, and I, but you weren't taught, you were, you know, somebody didn't sit you down and say, Finch, this is what you need to do. Right. But were you, were people living that example? Were they saying, you know, hey, we're going to have Easter dinner at grandma's house every single weekend to reinforce that family is important? You Absolutely. Know? And, Absolutely. And, 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 and so you may not have been expressly taught it, but you very well may have been. This is how you lead a good life. This mm -hmm. is what is important in life. And I, and I remember I had a, my girlfriend in high school gave me a poster and I had it above my, my bed and I saw it every day and it said, Happy are those who dream dreams and are ready to pay the price to make them come true. Wow. You know, and I love that. I, I mean, and I, you know, and I'm, you know, when you're a kid in high school and stuff, like, you don't know, you don't understand these things. I mean, I went to the Citadel, one of the toughest military colleges, in the world, but I don't think I understood what the Citadel taught me until I was older. You know, until right. I was, you know, maybe in my late twenties or early thirties when those synapses kind of all came together, you know, in my mm -hmm. prefrontal cortex. And but you know, the importance of of honor, of duty, of courage. I I, I read a book uh, a couple years ago called Legacy. Uh, it was written by a man by the name of James Kerr, and he he followed the New Zealand national rugby team for a, an, an entire season. And by all accounts, they are the most successful sports franchise in any sport in any country of all times. And what I found fascinating was when they bring on a new player, when they're bringing somebody onto the team, you would think they would bring them on for technical competency. And I don't know anything about rugby, so <laughs> I, I'm not going to try to you know even go there. But you know, are you a good rugby player? And I'm not saying they don't, but the two things they look at are – one character. What kind of person are you? You know, are you kicking the dog when you lose, or you know, you you know, beating on your girlfriend when you right. lose? What kind of person are you? And two, humility. You know, I mean, and I think back on on my career. How many times have I gone into an interview thinking, "Oh my God, I got to have all the answers." 
you know, I better know the answer to every question. And what they were saying with that humility is you don't have to have all the answers, but you individually won't have all the answers, but us collectively as a team will figure out the answer. So I think that was real important character and humility. What kind of person are you? And it's okay not to have all the answers. Kind of a good way to live your life. That's a great way to live your life. Mm -hmm. And listen, Mm -hmm. I want to say, and I got one last question, but it has been an honor and a pleasure having this conversation with you. Um, yeah, I think this was a great conversation, mm-hmm. and it's one I think we need to have more often. Yeah, especially in in today's society in in this generation. Mm-hmm. And so, I got one last question for you. What is one question you wish you were asked more often? That's a great question. (laughs) 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 What's one question I wish I would have asked? One question. I guess I would. I guess I wish I would have been asked more in life. What do you believe in? You know, Uh what what's important to you? What what's what's in your heart? What what kind of person are you? What kind of character do you have? I know that's a lot of questions, but I guess kind of gone down that road and got me to think about that even more as I was growing up. Yeah, that's good. Mm, that's yeah. a good. That's a good dinner time question. Uh huh. Yeah. I, I I'm glad to meet you, Terry. I like you pretty good. I well, thank you very much. Hey, as long as you cry, I like you very good too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious! I got the Kleenex right here. Yeah. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Well, Terry, we want to thank you again for coming on the fence. I, I have no doubt that so many people will, will get their asses off the fence because of uh, these four truths they've, they've heard today and a lot of what you, you've talked about today. So thank you again for coming on our show. We really appreciate it. Well, thank right. you for having me. You know, I always you, say it's, it's nice people like you that allow me to come on and tell my story. And hopefully between our conversation, we're going to have a positive difference in somebody's life. And if we do, today's been a good day. Today's been a good day. It's Ice Cube Day. Today was a good day. All right. (laughs) Hey, thanks for tuning in. Be sure to give us a follow, rate us, and leave a comment because we love to hear your thoughts. And until next time, get your ass off the fence.